Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here today, and it's been such a pleasure to, to meet the students and, and especially the faculty here today. You've got, you've got an amazing faculty. You're so lucky. Um, I'd like to start with, with writing, uh, reading from actually my second book, Notes from No Man's Land. Um, I want to read from this book because uh, there's an essay I wrote for this book um, that has taken on new, new meaning, new connotations for me. I, I wrote this essay in 2005-2006, uh, um, and this was before, the, before Ferguson, before the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but, uh, but as the, the series of very public uh, police killings and police brutality cases over the last couple of years have played out in the media, I always think back to this essay, um, which is a kind of reminder to me that, um, that this isn't a new phenomenon, that, that this is, is actually historically something that our, our country is, is built on. Um, and this piece didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. I had written almost the entire book uh, by the time I wrote this essay. And uh, so I had most of the manuscript in front of me. And, um, and I looked it over and I thought, this manuscript is, is quite serious and quite dark. And I, I think I ought to write um, something a little lighter to open it. And so I had this idea that I was going to write a a light, warm, inviting um, opening piece. And, um, and I was just casting around for ideas, fiddling with this microphone, seeing if I can solve this problem. It seems to be mocking me. Every time it slumps, I feel like it's mocking me. So, um, Let's see if you need a screwdriver. A screwdriver to fix that problem? You're right. I'm, I'm not going to fix it with my hands. So we'll just, we'll just let it do its little thing. Um, I think you all can hear me though, right? I can hear myself echoing back from this. <laughs> there it goes, okay. Still hear me? Yes. Okay, so we don't even need this thing. Um, so I had this idea, yeah, that I was going to write something lighter, brighter, funny. I thought I was going to write a funny essay. And, um, and I was going to write about telephone poles and, and telephones. And, the reason I gravitated towards this subject is I, I've always loved the, the aesthetics of telephone poles and wires, and I thought, um, what's what's the symbolism behind this? And I thought oh, it's a symbol it's a symbol of our efforts to be connected to each other, and to me that was quite beautiful. And I thought, okay, this is the warm place that I'd like to open this book. Um, but as with a lot of creative work, it did not. This essay did not go the way I thought it was going to go. What I had planned didn't happen on the page. Um, it, it, so I'll read you what happened once I did my research. Uh, and this piece is called Time and Distance Overcome. Of what use is such an invention? The New York World asked shortly after Alexander Graham Bell first demonstrated his telephone in 1876. The world was not waiting for the telephone. Bell's financial backers asked him not to work on his new invention because it seemed too dubious an investment. The idea on which the telephone depended, the idea that every home in the country could be connected by a vast network of wires suspended from poles set an average of 100 feet apart, seemed far more unlikely than the idea that the human voice could be transmitted through a wire. Even now, it's an impossible idea that we're all connected all of us. At the present time, we have a perfect network of gas pipes and water pipes throughout our large cities, Bell wrote to his business partners in defense of his idea. In a similar manner, it's conceivable that cables of telephone wires could be laid underground or suspended overhead, communicating by branch wires with private dwellings, counting houses, shops, manufactories, etc., uniting them through the main cable. Imagine the mind that could imagine this, that could see us joined by one branching cable. This was the mind of a man who wanted to invent, more than the telephone, a machine that would allow the deaf to hear. For a short time, the telephone was little more than a novelty. For 25 cents, you could see it demonstrated by Bell himself in a church 
along with singing and recitations by local talent. From some distance away, Bell would receive a call from the invisible Mr. Watson. Then the telephone became a plaything of the rich. A Boston banker paid for a private line between his office and his home so that he could let his family know exactly when he would be home for dinner. Mark Twain was among the first Americans to own a telephone, but he wasn't completely taken with the device. The human voice carries entirely too far as it is, he remarked. By 1889, the New York Times was reporting a war on telephone poles. Wherever telephone companies were erecting poles, homeowners and business owners were sawing them down or defending their sidewalks with rifles. Property owners in Red Bank, New Jersey, threatened to tar and feather the workers putting up telephone poles. A judge granted a group of homeowners an injunction to prevent the telephone company from erecting any new poles. Another judge found that a man who had cut down a pole because it was, quote, obnoxious, was not guilty of malicious mischief. Telephone poles, newspaper editorials complained, were an urban blight. The poles carried a wire for each telephone sometimes hundreds of wires, and in some places there were also telegraph wires, power lines, and trolley cables. The sky was netted with wires. The war on telephone poles was fueled, in part, by that terribly American concern for private property, and a reluctance to surrender it for a shared utility. And then there was a fierce sense of aesthetics, an obsession with purity, a dislike for the way the poles and wires marred a landscape that those other new inventions, skyscrapers and barbed wire, were just beginning to complicate. And then, perhaps, there was also a fear that distance, as it had always been known and measured, was collapsing. The city council in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, ordered policemen to cut down all the telephone poles in town. And the mayor of Oshkosh, Wisconsin, ordered the police chief and the fire department to chop down the telephone poles there. Only one pole was chopped before the telephone men climbing all the poles, before the telephone men climbed all the poles along the line, preventing any more chopping. Soon, Bell Telephone Company began stationing a man at the top of each pole as soon as it had been set, until enough poles had been set to string a wire between them at which point it became a misdemeanor to interfere with the poles. Even so, a constable set down, cut down two poles holding 40 or 50 wires, and a homeowner saw down a recently wired pole, then fled from police. The owner of a cannery ordered his workers to throw dirt back into the hole the telephone company was digging in front of his building. His men threw the dirt back in as fast as the telephone workers could dig it out. Then he sent out a team with a load of stones to dump into the hole. Eventually, the pole was erected on the other side of the street. Despite the war on telephone poles, it would take only four years after Bell's first public demonstration of the telephone for every town of more than 10,000 people to be wired, although many towns were wired only to themselves. By the turn of the century, there were more telephones than bathtubs in America. Time and distance overcome, read an early advertisement for the telephone. Rutherford B. Hayes pronounced the installation of a telephone in the White House one of the greatest events since creation. <laughs> the telephone, Thomas Edison declared, annihilated time and space and brought the human family in closer touch. In 1898, in Lake Cumarant, Mississippi, a black man was hanged from a telephone pole. And in Weir City, Kansas, and in Brookhaven, Mississippi, and in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the hanged man was riddled with bullets. In Danville, Illinois, a black man's throat was slit and his dead body was strung up on a telephone pole. Two black men were hanged from a telephone pole in Lewisburg, West Virginia, and two in Hempstead, Texas, where one man was dragged out of the courtroom by a mob, and another was dragged out of jail 
A black man was hanged from a telephone pole in Belleville, Illinois, where a fire was set at the base of the pole, and the man was cut down half alive, covered in coal oil, and burned. While his body was burning, the mob beat it with clubs and cut it to pieces. Lynching, the first scholar of the subject determined, is an American invention. Lynching from bridges, from arches, from trees standing alone in fields, from trees in front of the county courthouse, from trees used as public billboards, from trees barely able to support the weight of a man, from telephone poles, from street lamps, and from poles erected solely for that purpose. From the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, black men were lynched for crimes real and imagined, for whistles, for rumors, for disputing with a white man, for unpopularity, for asking a white woman in marriage, for peeping in a window. In Pine Bluff, Arkansas, a black man charged with kicking a white girl was hanged from a telephone pole. In Longview, Texas, a black man accused of attacking a white woman was hanged from a telephone pole. In Greenville, Mississippi, a black man accused of, accused of attacking a white telephone operator was hanged from a telephone pole. In Purcell, Oklahoma, a black man accused of attacking a white woman was tied to a telephone pole and burned. Men and women in automobiles stood up to watch him die, read the newspaper accounts. The poles, of course, were not to blame. It was only coincidence that they became convenient as gallows, because they were tall and straight, with a crossbar, and because they stood in public places. And it was only coincidence that the telephone poles so closely resembled crucifixes. In Shreveport, Louisiana, a black man charged with attacking a white girl was hanged from a telephone pole. A knife was left sticking in the body. In Cumming, Georgia, a black man accused of assaulting a white girl was shot repeatedly, then hanged from a telephone pole. In Waco, Texas, a black man convicted of killing a white woman was taken from the courtroom by a mob and burned. Then his charred body was hanged from a telephone pole. A postcard was made from the photo of a burned man hanging from a telephone pole in Texas, his legs broken off below the knee, and his arms curled up and blackened. Postcards of lynchings were sent out as greetings and warnings until 1908, when the Postmaster General declared them unmailable. This is the barbecue we had last night, reads one. If we are to die, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in 1911, in God's name let us perish like men and not like bales of hay. And if we must die, Claude McKay wrote 10 years later, let it not be like hogs. In Pittsburgh, Kansas, a black man was hanged from a telephone pole, cut down, burned, shot, and stoned with bricks. At first, the Negro was defiant, the New York Times reported, but just before he was hanged, he begged hard for his life. In Cumberland, Maryland, a mob used a telephone pole as a battery ram to break into the jail where a black man charged with the murder of a policeman was being held. They kicked him to death, then fired 20 shots into his head. They wanted to burn his body, but a minister asked them not to. The lynchings happened everywhere, in all but four states, from shortly before the invention of the telephone to long after the first transatlantic call. More in the south and more in rural areas. In the cities and in the north, there were race riots. Riots in Cincinnati, New Orleans, Memphis, New York, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Houston. During the race riots that destroyed the black section of Springfield, Ohio, a black man was shot and hanged from a telephone pole. During the race riots that set fire to East St. Louis and forced 500 black people to flee their homes, a black man was hanged from a telephone pole. The rope broke and his body fell into the gutter. Negroes are lying in the gutters every few feet in some places, read the newspaper account.
1921, the year before Bell died, four companies of the National Guard were called out to end a race war in Tulsa that began when a white woman accused a black man of rape. Bell had lived to complete the first call from New York to San Francisco, which required 14,000 miles of copper wire and 130,000 miles of telephone poles. 130,000 telephone poles. My grandfather was a lineman. He broke his back when a telephone pole fell. Smashed him onto the road, my father says. When I was young, I believed that the arc and swoop of telephone wires along the roadways was beautiful. I believed that the telephone poles, with their transformers catching the evening sun, were glorious. I believed my father when he said, my dad could raise a pole by himself. And I believed that the telephone itself was a miracle. Now I tell my sister, these poles, these wires, don't look the same to me. Nothing is innocent, my sister reminds me. But nothing, I would like to think, remains unrepentant. One summer, heavy rains fell in Nebraska, and some green telephone poles grew small, leafy branches. to be difficult to read. That's, that's not usually my approach to writing. Um, but I found the research for this essay so um, emotionally difficult that I, I felt compelled to reproduce that difficulty on the page for the reader. Um, and one of the only ways I could think to do that was as a litany, um, which is how I experienced my research, this, this endless litany of lynchings, um, which was disturbing not just because of, of the litany itself, of the repeated um, lynchings, but because, um, because lynchings so often involved mutilation of the body as well. And I didn't realize that, but when I read all these, these accounts in the New York Times, I was using the New York Times historic database to, to do this research. Um, almost every newspaper article about a lynching from a telephone pole included the same grotesque details about the, the mutilation of the body. So often the man's genitals were cut off. Often the man was burned or shot or stabbed. Um, it, it wasn't actually enough to hang someone. The, the body also had to be really violently mutilated. And, um, and now when there's news stories about black men being killed by police, this is what it, it feels to me part of the same litany. It feels like an extension of a litany that started with Jim Crow and has extended into our contemporary moment. Um, which makes it, I think, you know, all the more painful. So, I'm going to read from my next book, um, which I would say is, is changing gears, but in my mind it's actually not really. I, I thought after I finished Notes from No Man's Land, I thought I was pretty exhausted from writing a whole book about racial oppression, and I thought I wanted to write about something completely new. And um, and I was attracted to writing about vaccination and writing about medical issues, in part because I had the illusion that I would be in some completely new arena where I would no longer have to be working with the issues that I was working with in, in Notes from No Man's Land. But I didn't really get very far into this book at all before it dawned on me that there's really nowhere you can go that where you get away from racism. It, it's everywhere. And so um, you, you don't have to research far into um, our medical system and medical care before you realize that, again, this is another arena where there's immense inequality and, um, and immense injustice in, in our country. So, in many ways, I see this this third book on immunity as an extension of, of Notes from No Man's Land, though it's stylistically very different, and on the surface it seems to be about an entirely different subject matter. So, one of the surprises for me in this book was that vampires came up a lot. Um, 
And I, I was not, before I started reading this book, a, a fan of vampires. I didn't read vampire literature, but um, vampires presented themselves as important to this text. And so I, I became a, a vampire a, aficionado, kind of. Um, and I'm going to read to you some sections that, that deal largely with vampires. What's that? was my son's first phrase. And for a long time, it was all he could say. As he learned to talk, I learned in naming the parts of things for him, how often our language reflects our bodies. We give a chair, arms, legs, a seat, and a back, writes the poet Marvin Bell. A cup has its lip and a bottle its neck. The ability to make and understand basic metaphors of this kind arrives with language, which is itself made of metaphor. Plumbing most any word will reveal what Emerson called fossil poetry, metaphors submerged below the surface of our current usage. Fathom, of means of measuring the depth of the ocean, now means understand, because its literal origin, using outstretched arms to measure cloth from fingertip to fingertip, was once used as a metaphor for grasping an idea. Our bodies prime our metaphors, writes James Geary, and I is another his treatise on metaphor, and our metaphors prime how we think and act. If we source our understanding of the world from our own bodies, it seems inevitable that vaccination would become emblematic. A needle breaks the skin, a sight so profound that it causes some people to faint, and a foreign substance is injected directly into the flesh. The metaphors we find in this gesture are overwhelmingly fearful and almost always suggest violation, corruption, and pollution. The British call it a jab, and Americans favoring guns call it a shot. Either way, vaccination is a violence. Throughout the 19th century, vaccination left a wound that would star, the mark of the beast, some feared. In an Anglican Archbishop's 1882 sermon, Vaccination was akin to an injection of sin, an abominable mixture of corruption, the lees of human vice, the dregs of venial appetites that in afterlife may foam upon the spirit and develop hell within and overwhelm the soul. It was the poison of adders, the blood, and entrails, and excretions of rats, bats, toads, and sucking whelps that was imagined into vaccines of the 19th century. This was the kind of organic matter, the filth, believed responsible for most disease at that time. It was also a plausible recipe for a witch's brew. Vaccination was fairly dangerous then, not because it would cause a child to grow the horns of a cow, as some people feared, but because arm-to-arm -arm vaccination could communicate diseases like syphilis, as some people suspected. In arm-to-arm -arm vaccination, the pus from the blister that developed on a recently vaccinated person's arm was used to vaccinate another person. Even after vaccination no longer involved an exchange of bodily fluids, bacterial contamination remained a problem. In 1901, a vaccine contaminated with tetanus bacteria killed nine children in Camden, New Jersey. Now our vaccines are, if all is well, sterile. Some contain preservatives to prevent the growth of bacteria. So now it is, in the activist Jenny McCarthy's words, the frickin' mercury, the, the, the ether, the aluminum, the antifreeze that we fear in our vaccines. Our witches brew is chemical. There is not actually any ether or antifreeze in vaccines, but these substances speak to the anxieties about our industrial world. They evoke the chemicals on which we now blame our bad health and the pollutants that now threaten our environment. An 1881 handbill titled The Vaccination Vampire warns of the universal pollution delivered by the vaccinator to the pure babe. Known to feed on the blood of babies, the vampires of that time became a ready metaphor for the vaccinators who inflicted wounds on infants. Blood-sucking monsters of ancient folklore were hideous, but Victorian vampires could be seductive. The macabre sexuality of the vampire dramatized the fear that there was something sexual in the act of vaccination, an anxiety that was only reinforced when sexually transmitted diseases.
were spread through arm-to-arm -arm vaccination. Victorian vampires, like Victorian doctors, were associated not just with corruption of the blood, but also with economic corruption. Having virtually invented a paid profession and being almost exclusively available to the rich, doctors were suspect to the working class. Bram Stoker's Count Dracula is clearly of the bloodthirsty bourgeois. He keeps dusty piles of gold coins in his castle, and gold coins pour from his cloak when he's stabbed. But it's difficult to read him as a vaccinator. Of all the metaphors suggested within the plentiful pages of Dracula, disease is one of the most obvious. Dracula arrives in England just as a new disease might arrive, on a boat. He summons hordes of rats, and his infective evil spreads from the first woman he bites to the children she feeds on unwittingly at night. What makes Dracula particularly terrifying, and what takes the plot of the story so long to resolve, is that he is a monster whose monstrosity is contagious. Germ theory was widely accepted by 1897 when Dracula was published but only after having been ridiculed earlier in the century. The suspicion that microorganisms of some sort cause disease had been around for so long that the theory was already considered outdated by the time Louis Pasteur demonstrated the presence of germs in the air with his corked and uncorked flasks of sterile rock. Among the vampire hunters who pursue Dracula, sterilizing his coffins so that he cannot take refuge in them, are two doctors who initially disagree on their diagnosis. The younger doctor cannot bring himself to believe in vampires, despite the evidence, so the older doctor delivers an impassioned speech on the intersection of science and faith. Let me tell you, my friend, he says, that there are things done today in electrical science which would have been deemed unholy by the very men who discovered electricity, who would themselves not so long before have been burned as wizards. He then goes on to evoke Mark Twain. I heard once of an American who so defined faith, that which enables us to believe things which we know to be untrue. He meant that we shall have an open mind and not let a little bit of truth check the rush of a big truth, like a small rock does a railway truck. Dracula is as much about this problem, the problem of evidence and truth, as it is about vampires. In proposing that one truth may derail another, it invites an enduring question. Do we believe vaccination to be more monstrous than disease? I'm going to skip ahead about 50 pages. In the first few weeks after my son was born, a March wind blew off the lake and through our apartment, where I sat for hours each night in a stiff wooden rocking chair, rocking my restless baby and staring at the windows through which I could barely see the shadows of tree limbs flailing in the wind. The chair creaked and the wind moaned, and I heard a tapping at the glass and a flapping around the sill, and I knew a vampire was there, trying to get in. By daylight, I would be reminded that a flagpole was near that window with a flapping flag and a tapping line, but in the moment, I felt terror. I was calmed only by my belief, instilled by a recent vampire movie, that the vampire could not enter without my permission. I avoided mirrors in the dark. When I slept, I woke from bloody nightmares, and I saw things moving that were not moving. During the day, I began to think that the lake was singing to me. It was a single low tone that only I could hear. I was as disquieted by this as I was comforted. I kept two tall glass liter jars of drinking water on the table next to my rocking chair. Staring at the jars as I nursed the baby, I recalled being told in the hospital that I had lost two liters of blood. It remained a mystery to me how anyone could have known how much blood I lost because it went all over the floor. <coughs> My husband would describe to me much later the sound it made, the lapping of small waves as the blood puddled and nurses pushed at the edges of the pool with towels. But I never saw any of it, never even heard the lapping sound, 
So those two glass liter jars were my only measure of what I had lost. Vampires were in the air then. True Blood was a new television series and The Vampire Diaries was about to premiere while The Twilight Saga played out in a series of books I didn't read, followed by movies I didn't see. A car parked on my block had a bumper sticker that read, Blood is the New Black. And on my first visit to the bookstore after giving birth, I noticed a new section devoted exclusively to vampire novels for teenagers. Vampires were part of the cultural moment. But as a new mother, I became fixated on them, in part because they were a way for me to think about something else. The vampire was a metaphor, though it's hard to say whether it was a metaphor for my baby or for myself. My baby slept by day and woke at night to feed for me, sometimes drawing blood with his toothless jaws. He grew more vigorous each day, even as I remained weak and pale. But I was living off blood that was not mine. Immediately after my son's birth, in an otherwise uncomplicated delivery, my uterus inverted, bursting capillaries and spilling blood. After giving birth without any medical intervention, without painkillers or an IV in place, I was rushed to surgery and put under general anesthesia. I woke up disoriented, shivering violently under a pile of heated blankets. That happens to everyone who comes down here, my midwife observed from some bright and hazy place above me inadvertently reinforcing my sense that I had, indeed, gone down to the banks of the River Styx. Where is down here? I kept wondering. I was too weak to move much, but when I tried, I discovered that my body was lashed with tubes and wires. I had an IV in each arm, a catheter down my leg, monitors on my chest, and an oxygen mask on my face. Alone in the recovery room, I slipped into sleep, waking with the unnerving sensation that I'd stopped breathing. Machines were beeping around me. A nurse fiddled with the machines, mentioning that she thought they might be malfunctioning because they seemed to be indicating that I'd stopped breathing. I coughed and couldn't catch my breath, struggling to say help before I passed out. A doctor was standing at the foot of my bed when I came to, and it was decided that I would receive a transfusion. This excited the nurse who told me that transfusions are like magic. She'd seen the color come back into gray people after they had received transfusions. Without using the words life or death, she let me know that she'd seen the dead come back to life. I didn't feel like I was coming back to life as the refrigerated blood entered my veins. I felt an ominous cold ache spreading from my arm towards my chest. People aren't usually awake for this, the doctor said when I mentioned the temperature of the blood. He was standing precariously on a stool with wheels, improvising a rig that would hold the bag of blood closer to the ceiling so that gravity would pull it into my body more quickly. By hospital policy, my baby couldn't be in the recovery room with me, and the doctor couldn't change that, but he could try to devise a way to get the blood into me faster so that I could leave the recovery room sooner. My vision began to blacken around the edges, my stomach turned, and the room spun around me. This was all normal, the doctor told me. Remember, he said, it's not your blood. There are many explanations for the extreme fearfulness I felt in the weeks after my son's birth. I was a new mother, I was far from my family, I was anemic, I was delirious with fatigue. But the true source of my fear eluded me until months later, when I went out on Lake Michigan in my little canoe made of bent wood covered with a transparent canvas. I'd been on the lake many times before in that boat, and I'd never been afraid. But this time my blood was pounding in my ears. I was newly aware of the immensity of the water under me, its vast, cold depths, and I was painfully aware of the fragility of my boat. Oh, I thought to myself, with some disappointment, I'm afraid of death. Vampires are immortal, but they're not exactly alive. Undead was the term Bram Stoker used for Dracula. Frankenstein and zombies and any number of animated corpses are all undead, rather than immortal in the manner of Greek gods. <coughs> 
The term undead amused me in the months when I was recovering from my son's birth, a time when I frequently found reason to think of it. I was alive and gratefully so, but I felt entirely undead. Nitroglycerin was injected into me during the surgery that repaired my uterus. The same thing that's used in bombs, my midwife reported. I wanted the IV lines out of my arms as soon as I left the recovery room so that I could hold my son comfortably, but the midwife explained that I needed intravenous antibiotics to prevent infections. You had a lot of people's hands in you, she said frankly. Some of the hands were hers, in me to help deliver the baby in the placenta, but then there was also my surgery, which was performed exclusively with human hands, leaving no incisions. When I learned this, it struck me as both magical and mundane that the technology that had saved me was simply hands. Of course, our technology is us. You've had a lot of people's hands in you was a phrase I would hear in my mind for a long time after that surgery, along with, remember, it's not your blood. My pregnancy, like every pregnancy, had primed me for the understanding that my body was not mine alone, and that its boundaries were more porous than I'd ever been led to believe. It was not an idea that came easily, and I was dismayed by how many of the metaphors that occurred to me when I was pregnant were metaphors of political violence, invasion, occupation, and colonization. But during the birth, when the violence to my body was greatest, I was most aware not of the ugliness of a body's dependence on other bodies, but of the beauty of it. Everything that happened to me in the hospital after my son's delivery, even things I understand now as cold or brutal, I experienced at that time as a glow with humanity. Alarms were sounded for me, doctors rushed to me, bags of blood were rigged for me, ice chips were held to my lips. Human hands were in me and in everything that touched me. In the nitroglycerin, in the machines that monitored my breathing, in the blood that wasn't mine. If you want to understand any moment in time, or any cultural moment, just look at their vampires, says Eric Newsom, author of The Dead Travel Fast. Our vampires are not like the remorseless Victorian vampires who had a taste for the blood of babies and didn't seem to feel badly about it. Our vampires are conflicted. Some of them go hungry rather than feed on humans, and some of them drink synthetic blood. Almost all of these current vampires are struggling to be moral, the journalist Margot Adler observed after immersing herself in vampire novels and vampire television for months after her husband's death. It's conventional to talk about vampires as sexual, with their hypnotic powers and their intimate penetrations and their blood drinking and so forth, she reported. But most of these modern vampires are not talking as much about sex as they are about power. Power, of course, is vampiric. We enjoy it only because someone else does not. Power is what philosophers would call a positional good meaning that its value is determined by how much of it one has in comparison to other people. Privilege, too, is a positional good. And some have argued that health is, as well. Our vampires, whatever else they are, remain a reminder that our bodies are penetrable, a reminder that we feed off of each other, that we need each other to live. Our vampires reflect both of our terrible appetites and our agonized restraint. When our vampires struggle with their need for blood, they give us a way of thinking about what we ask of each other in order to live. I'm going to stop there. And um, I'm happy to take questions.
write an essay about beauty and about my grandfather and all these things. Can you say a little bit more about that moment when you realize, oh my god, this essay is no longer about that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the way I was doing my research, I often end up using research tools not exactly in the way they're intended to be used. And so that's what I was doing in this case. I was in the New York Times historical database, and I plugged in telephone pole. That was my only search term. And then I plugged in um, the, the, the date of the invention of the telephone pole, and then all the way to the first transatlantic call. So that is a huge period of time. Um, like uh, roughly 1880 or 1890 to 1930 or something along there. And um, and of course, because I've done such a wide search, I turned up thousands and thousands of articles. But this is not unusual for my research process. I sat down and I was going to devote several days to just reading through all these articles um, because I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was just going to devote that time to reading through. And at first, you know, right up until about 1900, the articles that I was reading were kind of what I thought I was looking for. They were very um, odd, samey stories, and many of them were funny and strange. Um, and, and they were that great old New York Times style, which was much more quirky than it is now. Um, and there was still, there's one anecdote that I wanted so badly to use in this essay, but once the essay took on its shape, it, it didn't fit, it didn't work. But there was an amazing anecdote about, so this is when telephone poles were brand new, the police found a man alive tied in a sack at the top of a telephone pole. And they cut it down and discovered that the sack had a big note on it that said, don't let this man out until he tells you what he's done. <laughs> Which I thought was a beautiful punishment for somebody. <laughs> into a telephone pole. For a period of time, the New York Times reported every time a car, so cars were new and telephone poles were new, and every time a car hit a telephone pole, it made the news for a long time. Um, so there were many, many articles about a car is hit a telephone pole. Um, and, and so that's the kind of material I thought I was going for, and, and I really had kind of the whole essay sketched out in my mind. But then I hit the period of time, which was the bulk of my articles, from 1900 to 1920, which was, and I knew this intellectually, but it's different to know something intellectually and, and experience it as a researcher. Um, this was Jim Crow, and so um, during this period, there's a period of years in there where almost every time, not exactly every time, but almost every time the word telephone pole appeared in the New York Times, it was because someone had been watching. And, um, and it was really alarming. And, and I remember um, a night, I actually stayed up all night, uh, one of these nights in Iowa, I stayed up all night reading through these articles. And I thought, by dawn, I thought I was gonna vomit. It was, it was a horrible experience. Um, and it was very visceral. And, and like I said, all these grotesque um, details were repeated again and again and again. Um, and after I'd had that experience, that, that really, um, it was so affecting that I still, I, I still feel affected by it. I feel affected when I read this essay and when I talk about it. And it was so affecting that I felt like there was no way I could write the essay that I thought I was going to write. That I had to kind of bear witness to what had happened and that I had to make this essay reflect what the research had shown me. Um, and, and I do feel, I, I find this often in my research, it's not usually the start, but I often find that the research tells me where to go as a writer and, and vice versa. The writing will tell me where to go as a researcher. But in this case, I felt very instructed um, by my research. I, I felt that I had no choice, um, basically. It, it, and then, but the choice I did make as a writer was that I wanted the reader to have something of my experience. I opened with that little frame of the lighter material, the, the lighter, zanier material, because I, I did want the reader to have the experience that I've had as a researcher of, of dipping into this, this interesting, eclectic history, only to find this deep, dark well there um, of, of really sinister material. Um, so that's, that's how it, it came to be. 
And you definitely don't have to have questions. This isn't like a mandated question and answer time. But I, I just want to make it possible for you to ask questions if you want to. I'm also totally happy to release you into the night. <laughs> in that it, it lands me 
places that I didn't expect to go, and it, and it shows me that things are related that I didn't realize were related. Um, and that, for me as a writer, is a huge gift. And, um, and it's still very surprising to people who haven't read this book when I tell them that I wrote quite a bit about vampires and Dracula specifically. People raise their eyebrows and they say, well, how did that ever get in there? And it, it feels like totally kind of out of the blue. Um, but the other thing that Dracula did for me, Dracula has an amazing scene, actually several amazing scenes, that were very resonant for me as someone who had received a blood transfusion. And, um, and actually receiving that blood transfusion was part of what propelled me into um, the thinking that, that, that initiated this book. Um, I had the experience of feeling like some anonymous donor had saved my life. And, um, and that was very moving to me. And, uh, and when I was searching around for a metaphor for vaccination, um, I, it occurred to me that actually blood banking was an interesting metaphor for the more abstract um, kind of banking that goes on with vaccination. You know, often, we're, we're very often vaccinating people who are probably not the ones who are most vulnerable to the diseases they're being vaccinated against. But what we're doing as a society is banking immunity. And we're banking it for people who are HIV positive and newborn babies and the very elderly and people who will have very serious problems if they get a disease. Um, and, and I like to have a very concrete metaphor for this much more abstract idea. Um, and so I was really moved to see there's, there's a love scene in Dracula. And the love scene is three men are in love with the, the heroine, um, Mina or Minna. And, um, and she, oh no, it's not her, it's her best friend. So there's two women, they're both very attractive, and, um, and one is being fed on by a vampire at night by Dracula. And she becomes anemic, she needs blood. And, um, and these men are all very eager to give their blood to this woman that they love. And so there's this semi-funny, semi-erotic scene where the men are like jostling each other for the opportunity to give blood to this woman they love. And eventually they all need to give blood to her right? because she keeps on being eaten <coughs> by the vampire. And, um, and it was so interesting to, for me to see um, the, the blood transfusion as, a, as an act of love. And um, because that is actually how I experienced it. it. It was an anonymous act of love. But I felt real love in my heart for whoever that person was who had given type O blood which <coughs> needed, um, to you know, save my life, even though that's not what they knew or thought they were doing. Um, so that's a really long answer to your question. And I, I should probably release you all. Um, but thank you so much for coming. It's been a huge pleasure to be here today.